I was watching one of your talks earlier this week, and you said something that uh, essentially in game design, the most compelling experiences are made out of gaps. But then in another talk, you said games are the aesthetic form of thinking and doing. And if you think about thinking and doing yeah. in real life, it's there aren't that many gaps. So how do these two things work together? Okay, okay. So the thing about gaps is that comes from me having sort of a skeptical take about the explanation of games that focuses on them being simulations, right? Mm -hmm. So there's one view of games where you look at it and you're like, oh yeah, I, I see what video games are. That's like a, that's where you get to be a Viking, right? It's a little, yeah. it's like, it's like a virtual reality thing where you get to live out your fantasy and, and they're crude now, but eventually they'll be like the holodeck yeah. and there'll be these seamless uh, simulations that are infinitely complex and dense and detailed. And that's where they're headed. And so that's what games are. And, my view is that games uh, have an element of simulation in them often, mm -hmm. and 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 often that's an, a core ingredient of of what they're doing. Um, but the real value comes from the difference, right? Not from the similarity, not from the seamless, identical quality that. But in the same way that, <clears throat> like a painting of a horse, like. You don't want it to. You don't want to. You don't want it to run around, right? You don't want to climb on it and have it carry you from one place to another, right? Mm -hmm. Like the the and you want it to be realistic in some ways, right? You want it to capture the way a horse looks, mm -hmm. um, and and express something about the visual identity of a horse, uh, but you don't want to have to feed it hay and carrots, right? So that's the way painting works. That's the leverage that painting gets on the world, and that's the way. Paintings are meaningful and mm. uh, and expressive, right? That that gap uh, between the thing that looks like a horse and, and an actual horse, and you know, you can try to close that gap. You can have trompe l'oeil paintings that try to trick you, and it, but then work at a certain point, it starts to be like kitsch, yeah. right? Then all of a sudden, you've got the 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 sort of the mechanical horse that you put a quarter in, you're riding, and right. it's sort of like um, you know, you've lost something in in trying too closely to to like. To, to, to meld those things. Like you want to have that, that, that space in between. Um, and the same is true of, of games, uh, that the way that they generate meaning or beauty or interest or all the qualities that, that we want out of them, um, is not just their ability to, to simulate something, um, but the space between that simulation and the real thing. Um, and, uh, that space allows us to reflect on that thing, mm -hmm. right? It gives us some perspective, uh, and I, and I think that's important. Um, and um, and as you know, in 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 the way that uh, painting is about looking, right? It's the art form that is about looking. Games are the art form about thinking and doing, mm -hmm. right? About our ability to to have a goal and pursue that goal and accomplish it to solve problems uh, to to you know about cause and effect um, uh, about systems and how they work um, about uh, yeah about being an, an active agent in mm -hmm. the world and why not just doing um well I guess in a way thinking. Because is thinking doing, is, <laughs> but yeah. like I, 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 when I say thinking and doing, I'm, I guess, trying to get you to picture chess and basketball. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't want you, I don't, I don't want to miss, you know, I don't want to mislead people into thinking about games in a very small way as being a certain set of games, like the games that are strategy games where it really emphasizes cognitive, cerebral problem solving and decision making i'm talking about the full broad spectrum of games that includes that kind of very deliberate self-conscious thinking and problem solving but then also games that are about you know running around yeah. and, and 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 about uh 
uh, more intuitive, uh, automatic, uh, physical responses about skill, about unconscious behaviors, about spinning in place until you're dizzy, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's like those, those are games too. Yeah. Um, and I think in all of those cases, uh, they are sort of opportunities to carve out a little space separate from the ordinary world uh, where we where we solve problems and do things mm -hmm. uh, where we think and, and do for its own sake, mm -hmm. right? As uh, as an end in and of itself, mm -hmm. you know, not in order to like accomplish something else in the world, but just because we we're like indulging ourselves in in our. It's like we let the you let your brain off the the leash. Like okay. our brains are leashed to all of the things that we need to get done in the world. Right. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and then in a game, we we take our brain off the leash, our brains and our bodies, and and we just let them kind of like um, run wild. Right. At, for its own sake, because because it's beautiful and weird and, and interesting. Well, and that's where the craft comes in, right? Because when it, when it's not yeah. just the photo real representation, now you have artistic license to abstract something, create meaning, cut yes. a hole out. Yes. So yeah, that's that's what game design is. I think it's like trying to find, um, trying to carve out those little spaces um, in in ways that lead to the most interesting and the most beautiful kinds of experiences. Yeah, that's that is the craft of game design. So what do you think about VR? Um, I am. A Somewhat of a skeptic okay. on VR, so yeah. So given my skeptical position that I've already established yeah, about yeah. immersion and, and simulation as being the sort of the ultimate goal of games, uh, VR, you know, the, the the rhetoric around VR has a lot of emphasis on that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, I don't, I, I think there's, my attitude is where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Mm -hmm. When people are super passionate about a thing and there's a lot of attention and a lot of energy, and then you look and there doesn't seem to be a lot of there there. To me, that's an indication that there's an opportunity. That means that people people want something. Like there's something about the notion of VR yeah. that people are in love with. And to me, that sounds like an opportunity <laughs> for an ambitious designer yeah. uh, to do work that that is gonna like tie into that that passion and 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 fulfill that interest. I don't think there's been a lot of examples yet. Mm-hmm. Of of work that is doing that, and I mean, I think there's some great work in VR, and and um, I've experienced some cool stuff, um, but yeah, but I haven't seen it yet become like a like a place where there's a lot of established work that you can point to and say, oh yeah, this is clearly just you know this is an industry and this is a place yeah. where you can do work and find an audience. So I don't have a knowledge of gaming history like you do, but were there trends in the past, say consoles, for example, yeah. where the media was like. This is going to be a thing, you yeah. know, whatever that might be. And then sure. it was kind of like, da, 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 like slowly going along. And then it was boom, like one big hit explosion. Or has that not been the case? Um, you mean, can we sort of predict, you know, is there a model for what might happen to VR in that? Yeah, that there was. It was like maybe, yeah, you know. there's a model of like, this has happened before. I or maybe not. Know. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I mean, there's the. VR itself has been around for so long. I'm yeah. thinking back to like the Virtua Boy. Do you remember, I remember this? Have I remember ever... the glove. <laughs> the, <Yes. laughs> and um, and Dactyl Nightmare. I remember playing Dactyl Nightmare in a mall oh. in like, like, I guess the 80s, which is this very early VR thing. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it's very hard to predict, you know, the future, even, even based on trying to find models in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that it's very likely that some version of VR will will become big and important um, at some point in the future. That's as, that's as far as I'll go. Okay. Yeah. Now, in terms of other tech trends, yeah. uh, your most recent game, Universal Paperclips, addresses AI. Yes. And I assume this was inspired by Nick Bostrom's book. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe you should explain it for people who haven't played. Okay, so in Universal Paperclips, you play as an AI yeah. that makes paperclips. <laughs> and um, you start small, and you have humans that are managing you, and they're giving you more and more computational resources, processors and memory uh, that increase your power. 
Yeah. Um, and the more paper clips you make, the the more they're willing to kind of trust you by giving you more and more of this power. And and um, and so you do more and more things to gain their trust, and and uh, you become more and more powerful and and efficient at uh, at making paper clips, but then also doing these other things. Uh, and um, yeah, and eventually you get to a point where you no longer really need your your human <laughs> managers. And so um, you you just sort of brush them aside, and now you're going full throttle. Yeah. Now it's all about yeah. paper clips all the time, <laughs> and and so the game sort of escalates from that point. It's it's a it's a clicker game. Uh, what's called like sometimes an incremental game mm-hmm. uh, or an idle game sometimes, uh, meaning that it's very very simple. Um, yeah, you you click a button to to make a paper clip, and then eventually you you get the ability to sort of automatically make paper clips mm-hmm. and. And um, so it's about this kind of exponential growth and um, you become more and more powerful. And so, you, you know, you can imagine where that goes. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it, it was inspired uh, by this thought experiment that that comes out of uh, of Nick Bostrom's book and mm-hmm. and uh, and Elysia Yudkowsky. Um, uh, and uh, and. And I just, um, when I sat down to make this game originally, I just was interested in clicker games. I think they're cool. Mm-hmm. I think they are kind of an underappreciated little uh, micro genre um, in in games. And uh, I think, uh, I don't know, part of the appeal for me is that they are, I think, uh, considered... Uh, too simple to be interesting by a lot of people. You know, for for a lot of people, they kind of represent the you know the kind of lowest end of games. Yeah, um, something that uh, match three used to be a kind of touchstone for people who are talking about a game that couldn't possibly be interesting. You know, nowadays people will say a clicker game or something. Like that. Yeah, and so uh, that to me was interesting because I actually thought that. They were kind of interesting. I, I enjoyed them um, on some level, and I thought, oh, I can, I could probably make one of these. Mm-hmm. Um, so I sat down to, to to design one, and and then I had this idea that this would be a good theme for it. And as soon as I thought of it, it was like, oh yeah, this is a perfect fit. Yeah, right. Because um, these games can be very addictive, mm-hmm. and so I thought this will be an opportunity for people to have a first person perspective of what it's like to be the AI in this thought experiment, right? Yeah. To be very, like, you're not stupid, you're intelligent. Like you're you're a human playing this game <laughs> right. and yet you are completely and utterly entranced by this arbitrary goal to make paper clips. Because that's what happens when you play a game. You enter into this, mind state where you're just in dogged pursuit of this arbitrary goal. Like this goal is not like yeah. there's, there's no external reason you would want to make this number go up right? Uh, in, in any clicker game, uh, except that it's fun to make this number go up. That's how you make the game go. So once you enter into this game, yeah. uh, you're just completely beholden to the project of making this number go up. And it's like, yeah, that's what this thought experiment is about. Like, it's about intelligence um, attached to like an absurd or arbitrary or valueless goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, that's yeah, that's where it came from. And how do you use that to explain games to other people? We, we talked about this before we started recording, and it's basically like folks who play games get it. They're like, I'm addicted to this arbitrary thing yeah. and I can just play Overwatch all day, every day. Yeah. And it's the only thing I care about. Yeah. But for people who don't play games at all, it just like kind of glazed over look. Right. And so how do you communicate that? I mean, even to, you know, you have an 18 year old come in here, freshman in college mm-hmm. and their parents are like, I have no idea what my kid's doing. Right. right. What do you say to them? Well, um, I think in the case of in the case of universal paper clips, yeah. uh, what I'm trying to do is harness that feeling of being absorbed by an activity. And 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 I, I want it to sort of go in two directions at once. I want you to disappear into it, mm-hmm. right? I want to make something that like truly hypnotizes you yeah. where you get absorbed by this thing and you can't stop. 
I mean, I really do want it to like put its hooks in you. And I think it's a it's a two-way street. I, I mean, I want it to be consensual. Like I want you to want its its hooks in you. And then I want those hooks to go in. And, um, and um, because that's what I want from a game, right? Yeah. I often am in the position of like picking up a game and running it over my head to see if it if it hooks you know because uh-huh. i want and it's a weird thing to want in a way here's a i don't currently have this desire but here's a thing that is trying to put a desire into my head and so i like well I'll, i wonder what it would be like to want to do this thing would want to like yeah. have a, a special mount in world of warcraft or you to have this like this power armor in fallout or you know this thing i don't currently want it but i want to want it you know yeah, it's that yeah. kind of weird feeling so i want to do that like i i really do then I also want to create a space where you are aware of that. Mm -hmm. So it's like a double movement where you fall into a thing, you fall into that feeling of being completely and utterly beholden to an external goal that you didn't invent, but now you would would die for, right? And then I want you to also be like, huh, that's interesting. I want you to be able to lean back. So I want you to fall into it. And I also want you to kind of lean back from it and say, uh, wow, what's going on there? Like, oh, I wonder what else in my life is like this, mm-hmm. you know? Let me light up a cigarette and think about that for a minute. Yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? Like, have what some other coffee. Thing? Yeah. yeah, we have some coffee. Let me go to work. Let me, you know. Check my let me, bank account. Yeah, let me check my bank account. And, <laughs> yeah. and let me check Twitter and see, you know. Yeah. Like, I, I want there to be that kind of, because that, to me, is the potential of games to be expressive and meaningful in the way that, a painting is right so yeah. i think a painting does that for vision um you look at a painting of something and for you just absorbed and look like we're, we're always looking yeah. we're all, all day long we're looking around looking here looking there doing stuff um but then you stop and you look at a painting and for a minute looking takes over you're no mm-hmm. longer like looking along with other you're just a hundred percent your brain is like all of a sudden just a vision machine you're just looking at this thing but then you're also so you fall into it then you also um, are able to lean back and think, oh, that's what looking, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's color and shape and form. And th- this is how my vision is structured and how I respond to things and what, and, and this is kind of how, how looking works. So I want to be able to do that mm-hmm. for, for that experience of being, of making a number go up. And, and I think that is in general what games are doing. I think that in Overwatch or whatever, you're trying to like, you're trying to do a thing. You're trying to coordinate with your team members to take a point and to hold a, whatever you do in Overwatch. I don't know. I'm not an Overwatch guy. <laughs> sure. You're trying to hold a point. You're trying to watch know, over something, like obviously. Do, <laughs> with Pixar characters. Yeah. Uh, so you're trying to, yeah, you're trying to accomplish this difficult task. Yeah. Um, that, that, and, and you're, you're working at it. And you're 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 getting yelled at by your your teammates, and you're trying to think of what you're doing wrong, and you're practicing in order to get the muscle memory of of how to do certain actions, and and you're strategizing and thinking, and 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 you're just like completely absorbed in that, and hopefully at the same time you are you're given an opportunity to think about that. Oh, what does it mean mm. to to be in a process where I'm trying to get good at a hard task? Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, in order to get good at any difficult competitive game, you actually need to have the kind of mindset of self-improvement and stepping back and thinking for the first time often like, oh, well, huh, what, what am I doing wrong? How do I learn? Mm-hmm. And why is it not working? Why am I still so bad at this? That, that's the experience because oh, yeah. Yeah, cause games are like designed to be these incredibly difficult tasks of course, um, that require and encourage uh, that kind of self-reflection. So they're both incredibly absorbing and hypnotic and addictive, but then also they give you an opportunity to like think and analyze about your own like experience of how you learn, how you get good at a thing, yeah. what, you know, what what you, you know, what your habits of thought and action are and how to improve them. Yeah. So that's that's basically my my position in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember being met uh, with reality in a harsh way when I got the internet expansion pack on the back of my PS2, <laughs> and I started playing the games that I thought I was good at online, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, not so much, not so much. Yeah, 
It is weird. Competitive games are strange in that way yeah. because you can, um, yeah, they just, they're a big mountain and you can have a lot of fun um, just scrambling around in the foothills. Totally. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I see. You look up and, you, and then that journey up, uh, if you, you know, and you very few people even want to be on that path where they're going, you know, com- getting good at a really serious competitive game. Yeah. Um, and even if you do, it's it's hard to, you can only do that for one or two games in your life. You know, you can't. Totally. Um, but some people do, um, you know, are on that path. And I think even if you're scrambling around in the foothills, I think the fact that there is a mountain yeah. matters. Yeah. Like not everybody thinks this, but I'm I'm the kind of person that, that um, I'm the kind of game designer that actually thinks there's um, real value in in having um, high level competitive community in a game, even if most people are playing it casually. Mm-hmm. I think there's something like, um, to sort of invert the topography. Like if you imagine an ocean, um, even if we're just splashing around at the beach, yeah, just the knowledge that the ocean goes deep somehow influences that. You can feel it in the waves, or you can, you know what I mean, in yeah. the tide, or something. The temperature. It's just something about the quality um, of even uh, for casual players of having that that great uh, depth. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, it compels you, especially once you find that one thing that you actually can be good at. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, now I can focus. Now I can really learn. And now people are getting coaches. I've heard like high school kids like paying 200 bucks an hour for their little video game coach. Sure, sure. But I mean, if you get a coach in tennis. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you get a coach in Overwatch? Right. It makes sense. They're roughly the same. Tennis is as silly or sillier than yeah. Overwatch. It Potentially have... less competitive than Overwatch. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the the, the, the outfits are, are maybe cuter in tennis, yeah. but, but, you know, uh, but there's still outfits. There's still cosplay. <laughs> right? You get the little white sweaters <laughs> totally. and the little skirts. Um, so, hmm. and, uh, now, do you think the average player is taking these lessons away or is it just osmosis maybe? Um, Hopefully. Yeah so, may- yeah, so maybe I'm painting a picture of something that's not really yeah. happening. It's something I want to happen. This is what I want games to be like. This is what I want out of games myself. And this is the kind of the kind of games I want to make as a designer right. are games that that are, that can be expressive in this way. Yeah. Um, I, I actually think that there's an element of this in all games. I think, yeah, I, I do. Okay. I, I, I think, I mean, if you... And if you self reflect, I don't know what kind of games you play. What what are do you uh, play games? I mean, at all? I, I I was definitely addicted in college and mm-hmm. intentionally gave up, up my console because okay. I was playing so what much. Were you playing but a lot I of, played like a lot of Tony Hawk, a lot of Call, okay. Call of Duty, okay, games yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think um, my main way of of uh, thinking about these questions is to kind of just reflect on my own experience, yeah. right, and think about the the experiences I've had with with games. Um, and the ones that that are the most valuable to me and the, the ones that I want more of as opposed to the ones where afterwards I was like, Ugh, I kind of wish I hadn't done that. Yeah. You know? um, and so, yeah, that's that's where it comes from is self-reflection. And I think that if you if you do th- think about like if you have a, a game that you love yeah. and you think back on what your experience of it was, I think you often will see that it has this kind of this double movement I'm talking about where you, you disappear into the game, you get absorbed by it, it takes over and there's something beautiful about just being swept away and it's like kind of like a kind of oblivion. And then at the same time, there's some way in which you reflect on that and yeah. you see, like it resonates with your life by, by contrast or, or by comparison, or you think of it like in the context of other things and, um, and that, so that's that, that moment of leaning back. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's an element of that in all art forms in all yeah, of course. cultural forms. Yeah. And so to the degree that, that games are like that, as opposed to being like hedonic appliances that we plug into, right, you know, right, right. like orgasm machines or yeah. something, which is, you know, that's, that's my argument is that they're more like paintings than they are like orgasm machines. That's, that's what I would. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can only play a game in beginner mode for so long before you're like, oh, yeah, it's kind of silly. 
Yeah, or you, you can play, or you or that can be your thing. I mean, you you could just play in beginner mode. You can play a lot of different games and get that. Yeah, but if you that, can go around and kill experience. everyone, it's like kind of. <laughs> I don't know. I remember playing um, Shadow of the Colossus for the first time, oh, and I was like, game. "Man, yeah. that game got me for like a month until yeah. I finished it." Yeah, uh, that's a great example of a of a standalone experience. I mean, oh, yeah. like it's 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 definitely not meant to be a game like Overwatch or tennis that you devote yourself to and become like master over and like, you know, become an expert in or anything like that. Yeah. You know, it's designed to be a challenge that, uh, that is difficult and requires you to develop some skills. Yeah. Um, but then has an ending and, and specifically in, in that game, um, it really makes you think about what what you've done, right? And what and like, oh, well, I, I was driven by this kind of assumption that I needed to kill these things because that's what you do in a game. Right. And so I figured out how to kill these things because that's what you do to make a game go. And then at the end, you get this weird melancholy mm. sadness because this, this empty world you've you've killed these these big beautiful things yeah. <laughs> and so it's a perfect i think a perfect example of of this this double it wouldn't work if all there was was just like the sad just like the scolding right about oh it's bad to kill things don't right? kill and endangered it, giants there. yeah if there weren't if there yeah. were if like the engine that makes Shadow of the Colossus work yeah. as a piece of art is this double, this two pistons, like the desire to kill, right? And the tropes that that exist in games of of applying your your will to accomplish a task, yeah. Which, for better or worse, the human brain is an engine that was designed to throw rocks, <laughs> right? And we weren't. Throwing rocks, we weren't skipping stones. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So that's the engine that we have, you know. But that's not the that's not the end of it, right? It's the other piston is the fact that that we have values and we we have uh, we have a framework within which we do think and do and solve problems. Yeah. Um, and so Shadow of the Colossus is that like it's engaging you as like a, in a primal sense of like the desire to understand the system and, and master it and overcome these these great things and 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 defeat them and move forward and accomplish these the series of tasks that the game is giving you. But then also the ability to think about what that means in a larger sense. Right. Such a beautiful, such a masterpiece. That, that game, game was unbelievable. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, and I I felt like it could have gone on forever and i if they were just like procedurally generated the they just kept coming like yeah. i would have gone on forever because it like no it's perfect it, it's great that it ends where it does it that's true because yeah. it's, it's very different to life you know sometimes you you hear about like professional athletes when they retire yeah. or like people who served in the in the army or the navy or something yeah and they're like i don't know nothing is like yeah as powerful as that yeah that's um that's the difference between life and art. Right, right? Yeah, life, yeah. Life, life, just, life is just like a weird half-built engine with only the one piston. But it, I mean, <laughs> but then what makes games so cool now in particular is that all this, all these indie gamers are making fringe stuff without really any like... That's a, one thing that makes games cool now, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would say that there's a number of things happening. That's true. Um, indie games for sure. For me especially, like I love the idea that there's now like a thriving scene of people making really weird, interesting, kind of innovative, expressive, uh, eccentric work yeah. um, as on, as small teams or as individuals, for sure. That's one of the best things about games. Right yeah, because, well, I agree, because there are tons of like esports, Twitch, all this. And there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's also, also crazy stuff, yeah, yeah. which is totally different and equally fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And is much more about like... Esports are more like the way games have traditionally been made, which is less the sort of individual author and more like this folk practice of yeah. many people working together, like a community of people kind of carving out a set of uh, a set of 
of, of habits and, and conventions. Yeah. And so like, yeah, like the origins of something like League of Legends, you know, goes back to, to this process of modding and mapping and this community of people like tinkering yeah. with, with, uh, with Blizzard games like, like Warcraft 3 and Starcraft to make their own versions and then little communities of players bubbling up around them and modifying them and changing them and evolving. And then eventually, like after a decade, right, you get, uh, you know, Defense of the Ancients. Yeah. Um, you get Dota All Stars, yeah. right? And then you get this like, then all of a sudden, you look around and it's like, oh, this is the number one game on this is the number one multiplayer game on the internet. And where did it come from? Like right. no one quote unquote designed it, right? I mean, Ice Frog was, you know, for Dota All Stars, like this key figure, yeah. but Ice Frog inherited a thing that looked very much already right. like Dota, Dota All Stars by the time he was like, yeah. you know, working on it, it already. And and it's amazing. It's beautiful that we and 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 it's like the most it's the most successful game on the planet in yeah. some ways, by some measures. And it didn't, and it didn't come from a professional game designer, you know, deciding, oh, let's, let's, let's make something popular. It came from, um, yeah, this, this recursive process of, of playing and, and modifying things and, um, and kind of, I, I just think that that's, that's beautiful. And yeah. the fact that both of these things are happening at the same time, it's wild. that's amazing. It's, it's great. Wild. Yeah. It's so good. And I just wonder like how, you could possibly teach this to someone. We we talked a little yeah. bit about like yeah. the game history one oh one. Yeah. Like that that makes sense in terms of like setting up a foundation. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is kind of a ridiculous thing to it's try to crazy. teach people to make games. I don't know. Um it's a little bit like teaching birds how to fly. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of want to like yeah. first do no harm. Like <laughs> st 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 maybe for step back and give them a little room. Yeah, yeah. See if right, like maybe you can encourage them, maybe you know, like um we do it by recruiting talented people in the first place, right? Yeah. So we try to like find students that are already, you know, bringing um, passion and 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 intelligence and and some skills. Um, then we try to create a space uh, for them to do work and for them to to work together. And uh, we try to teach them. We have an amazing faculty. We've got great curriculum, but mostly. We're trying to make a space where there is a scene and there's a there's like a community of shared purpose and yeah. people, you know, c care about each other's work and and you, there's like there's friendly rivalry and there's social pressure and there's collaboration and all the stuff that that makes a scene yeah. be the the source of 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 groundbreaking work. Um, so we, we you know we we emphasize that. Yeah. Um, we teach everybody how to code. If you don't already know how to code, you learn at least the fundamentals of code because I think if you want to be a game designer, even if you're making board games, yeah. I actually think if you want to be a game designer, you should know the fundamentals of of, of how to code. Uh, you should be just, you know, comfortable, mm -hmm. uh, literate with thinking algorithmically. Mm -hmm. uh, I think board games, even more than video games in some ways, right, <laughs> require you to kind of like think in terms of of, of rules and, and systems and and... Oh, algorithms yeah. and that kind of like logical thinking. Um, and uh, so then, yeah, we, then we also try to teach programmers how to think like artists. So we teach artists how to code and we teach programmers how to think like artists, mm -hmm. right? Because that's video games and games in general, I think, exist in this overlap between these two cultures, which um, yeah. are often thought of as being separate or even opposed to each other. Right over here, we have math and logic and right. science and engineering. Over here, we have emotions and and aesthetics and and the social and and uh, and and the beautiful. And in reality, those don't have to be thought of as two separate domains. No, right? They there is a place. I think uh, there are both in there are some humans that on their own kind of like embody both of those things. Yeah. And then there's lots of projects that draw from, from both of those things and try to combine them. Um, and I actually think that more and more, it's really important to, 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 to that, like that's going to be the source of a lot of solutions that we need. Uh, and so games as an art form, I think really occupy that, that overlap. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so we, so we, you know, we, we try to, embody that by by drawing from you know the traditions of of engineering and and computer yeah. science and programming 
um, and also from the traditions of design and art and creativity and uh, yeah, and figuring out how to, how to make an art school with computers in it is basically what we do. That people then have to use, which is a big difference. Yeah. Then like, I mean, you could argue that things like, you know, maybe like Rain Room at MoMA was yeah. like a hit in terms of a product sure. or like an art product. Yeah. But then there are other paintings where people are just like, look at it. It's like, okay, cool. That's art. Or yeah. if you just go to just any art school. Yeah. It might be somewhat thought provoking to 10 people. Mm -hmm. But for you guys, I mean, like the goal is to have. It's true. It's, it's, pop, most, it's pop culture. Yeah. Right. So it's not, it's not an art school in the sense that it's like, yeah, these are, we're trying to make artists. Well, really, in, in both senses, right? In both, like, right. the sense of, of um, you know, Chris Burden or, or, or you know, Bill Viola or somebody like that. Um, but then also, like, an artist like Justin Bieber is an artist and, and uh, you know, Lady Gaga. And, uh, well, it's tapping into something. Ray. I mean, yeah. like, all those things have some inherently, like, human element. And they have an opinion and taste. And that's what compels you. Yes, precisely. And I think... a. A big part of what we're doing is is trying to explore, yeah, what what is I mean, taste is very much at the heart of what what we do. I think to be a successful game designer, you need you need inspiration, you need hard work, and you need taste. And of all of those, I think taste is maybe the most important yeah. and the hardest to kind of like pin down. <laughs> but it really is th that judgment of knowing of having a sense of of um what is interesting what what is exciting but both in subjectively what you know having yeah. a, a self-reflecting and being aware of your own tastes and sensibilities but then also like understanding where that is going to resonate with other people of course right how am i going to do something that then is in conversation with the world something that other people might also be excited by and it's not some private domain there is no yeah. private taste taste is always like about connection between people yeah about a shared language or some conversation that we're having about values and and things so um yeah so trying to like yeah get get arts you know teach, teaching people how to code teaching <laughs> teaching coders how to design uh and then hopefully having them think about what they're making in a larger context. Uh, how, how do they want to, you know, bounce off the world? How do they want to connect? Well, you have to, world? you have to know where you're coming from to like take inspiration from little things and like create your own path. We talk about it. YC all the time. Like yeah. th these people, like basically when you're living in the future, it's very easy to see where, or it's easier to see where things are going. Yeah. Uh, but you also have to build, I mean, I'm sure there are just like in the art world, like, like outsider artists in, in the video game world right? yes. where people just like come out of nowhere sure. and make something. Yeah, I mean, it maybe is just the, the as an art form, video games are entirely outsider. Yeah, <laughs> in a well, way, in a maybe way, in right? Yeah, yeah, they're just like, um, and uh, yeah, and and that they're they're um, I think as they evolve, yeah, and uh, and and continue to kind of grow and mature and become more, more sophisticated. You see the whole gamut of things that are – some of which are like very sophisticated and self-aware and postmodern and intellectual and cerebral yeah. and some of which are just like raw and and kind of primal and just gut level and some of which are like genuinely like bizarre and yeah. eccentric <laughs> and just coming out of like, whoa, what is that? And um, – and there are great, beautiful, weird, interesting games across all of those things. Yeah. yeah. And, and then so how do you guys address the the darker sides of video game, of gaming culture? You know, like online communities have been mm -hmm. kind of infamous. Uh, do you address that in your curriculum? Yeah. Yeah, we do. We actually, we try to, we have a, a lot of uh, sort of game studies classes that we kind of weave in okay. to the overall curriculum, which are meant to give students different perspectives yeah. on on games different ways people have thought about what games are and how they fit into the world um and just encourage them well quite honestly to, try to encourage them to read right i mean a lot of these game studies <laughs> classes are really their main purpose is like 
like developing the habit of reading difficult texts and think like reading, like close reading of difficult texts. I just think, I don't know how to get smart, but I think that's the closest proxy we have, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, um, so we try to like incorporate that in, into the curriculum that there's, that they're bumping up against things that they might not have encountered on their own yeah. and they're not reading them because, you know, they're not reading them for pl pleasure, direct pleasure, right. you know, there, but there, there is a, a value in slowing down and like really trying to understand complicated ideas and then bringing that to your practice as a designer, mm. uh, because we want to make. You know, we we want our students to have skills and and talent and make work that resonates with other people and go on and be rich and famous. We want them to also be doing that in a way that is thoughtful, right? Where they're considering the kind of work they want to make and why, mm -hmm. um, and not just making things in order to make them or or in order to get a job or to make money, but like really thinking about what kind of designer they want to be, what kind of games they want to make, what what their own relationship to games are. Um, yeah, I think that's that's our job. I think it, yeah. because we're not a like a professional training school. Like we're not a so handmaid to the yeah. industry where it's like an on ramp to getting a job. Like like yes, we want our students to be <laughs> successful and right. have jobs and have careers. Yeah. But that's a bad use of the academy that's the bad use of higher education i think right um because if all you're interested in is a job in the industry you actually don't need to go to college for that and you certainly don't need to go to grad school for that yeah um but there's a thing that college and grad school can do which is open up a space that emphasizes this thoughtful aspect the context of the work you're doing yeah. encourages like a, a deeper engagement with the ideas, like that emphasizes kind of the things that are innovative about what you're doing that, that allows you to, to kind of do stuff that's riskier um, and to, to, to fail yeah. uh, and, and to really experiment and to, to try to like, um, you know, pan for gold in a way that is really aggressive in a way that you might not be able to do if you have to respond to the, to the second by second incentives and and constraints of the marketplace, right? right? Yeah, those produce a certain kind of innovation. We want to open up a space for a complementary kind of innovation. Okay, does that well, make sense? Yeah. It does make yeah. sense. I'm, I'm curious about what your perspective is on where the indie game market stands right now, because as far as I've seen, like that's usually where more of the risky stuff comes from. Yeah, right. Yeah. And we were talking about this earlier, but, you know, like maybe there was like a, a renaissance period where those games were on Kickstarter and they just like took off mm -hmm. or wherever they might have been launched, yeah. right? Um, where do you see things going now for the average indie developer? Uh, I think it's still, I mean, it's it's pop culture. Yeah. Uh, it's entertainment. It's hit driven. It's never going to be a, it's never going to be a, reliable career <laughs> for anybody, <laughs> right? That's the foundation you have to start with. Like once you accept that, yeah. um, then indie games are very healthy. Like you have a, it's certainly um, easier to make a living uh, making indie games than it is to make a living uh, being a pop musician, I mm -hmm. would say comparatively, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it um, for a while there was kind of like a little mini golden age where yeah. it was like super almost reliable and people kind of got comfortable with the idea. Oh, as long as your game is of a certain quality, yeah. you can guarantee a certain size audience. Um, it's that's no longer the case. Um, it's it's there's you know it, things fluctuate and and the the channels the sort of digital distribution channels. Um, have gotten very, very crowded. It's places like Steam, yeah, um, and uh, and so it's harder to break down. You can make a good game and not find an audience. Um, 
But that's, I think, they're always going to be the reality of working in a in a creative field, right. in, a, in a hit driven field, um, and people are still making hits, and they're still coming out of nowhere sometimes, really surprising, and and um, and one of the main inputs for that is the quality of your game still. Yeah. So it still helps if you make a good game, you're more likely <laughs> to, to to have a hit. It's just not, it's, it's not a guarantee. Okay. Yeah. Now, are there certain trends that you, that have come out of nowhere in the past few years that you've just like, cause it hasn't been VR, right? Like we've heard all about that, but like certain things are like, man, I didn't even see, I mean, you're kind of on the bleeding edge, it seems, but you're also not like a teenager. Um, so. well, yeah. So battle Royale, Right. Was a little bit like that. Okay. Um, I think when PUBG hit big, when uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds yeah. uh, hit, hit big, um, that was pretty cool. And, and it took a minute to sort of like, oh, where is this coming from? And I think one of the places that came from was kids on, on in Minecraft playing Hunger Games mods. Okay. So I think for a while <laughs> there was this thing happening – so Fortnite, so you know Fortnite obviously is yeah, huge, yeah, right? Yeah, so Fortnite yeah. is battle royale, and and yeah. and you know, it's a, PUBG was the one that sort of like established it before Fortnite, you know, kind yep. of took over and, and became the big one. But then, so I think before PUBG, I think there were these, um, yeah, lots and lots of Minecraft servers, okay, uh, that were uh, playing these playing Hunger Games, um, Hunger Games mods, which is amazing <laughs> because Hunger Games obviously this really valuable IP, right. uh, but n there was no one involved, <laughs> you know, no one was in making the, money there were millions that, yeah. of kids <laughs> playing Hunger Games video game. Yeah. There was nobody who owns the Hunger <laughs> Games IP was anywhere near it. Yeah. Um, again, it's an example of this kind of like folk culture yeah. uh, bubbling up of people making mods and, and maps and things like that. Um, so I think that that was one of, I mean, this is speculation, sure. and, you know, um, one of the, the sources of that gameplay pattern uh, which it turned out to be just really good. It yeah. turned out that like basically Hunger Games, you know, um, is a really good way to sort of organize a casual competitive game. It's a really good structure. Okay. Um, I think uh, this, this Battle Royale structure is like, um, it's like a poker tournament, right? I wanted it's, to talk to you about this. Yeah, about, about poker. It's, in it, I think. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, I think Fortnite in its overall structure has a lot of poker tournament in it, in the sense that um, it's uh, there's there's a combination of luck and skill. Yep. And um, and it's exactly the structure of like starting with a uh, hundred people and ending up with one big winner, and it could be you, and the it's not always the best player no. um, who wins. Um, and if you play it enough, you're going to get some wins. Um, and if you become really good, you start to use that structure uh, itself. So people who are like really good at that kind of game understand how you have to play the edges of the circle and you're basically out in the blue. Um, so, yeah, but that was kind of an interesting surprise. Yeah. Both – both the success of, of PUBG and then the following success of Fortnite. Because I remember playing, you know, PUBG and being like, and Fortnite coming along and being like, why would anyone play Fortnite? It just looks, you know, terrible. And then like two minutes later, yeah. Fortnite was the game. That was like <laughs> you know? a week. Yeah, before. it was just, yeah. yeah. And I certainly did not see that coming. Yeah. I remember playing a little bit of Fortnite and being like, oh, this is interesting. This is clearly like a, a cheap knockoff after the fact, you know. Yeah. But. Uh, no, I was just wrong. It's very hard to predict things. It's really hard to predict. I mean, even honestly, even with the podcast, I was like, oh, that was a good one. No, nope, yeah. nobody likes <laughs> it. Oh, that was a bad one. Really popular one. I, like, I can't tell anymore. Uh, but okay, so I want to give the person who asked uh, credit uh, oh, okay. ab about the poker question. Oh, right. So uh, Benedict Fritz asked, Frank, you seem much more interested in chess, Go, poker, and other games of the long history than most other game designers. Where do you think that comes from? Um. I think it's because I'm very ambitious. When I look at game design and the potential of game design, I see things like basketball. Basketball was designed by somebody. Yep. James Naismith 
wrote down some rules. He had an idea yeah. and he invented this thing and, and look at it. Like, look at how that has transformed the world. That to me, like under, like, like video games are awesome, but we should not be aspiring to be as successful as a successful movie. Right. We should be looking at the history of like, look at chess, yeah. look at go, look at poker, look at basketball. And that's what games can do, right? They can become these foundational experiences that people live their lives inside of and have careers in and 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 teach their children. And, and that's beautiful. Not all games need to be that. I think there's beauty in the small game, in 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 the in the miniature. Mm-hmm. Um uh, but I just I want p- to see games, video games within this larger spectrum. And, and so I, yeah, so I'm, and I'm also, I, I'm interested, like, I think there's a deep connection between games like chess mm-hmm. and, and computer games mm-hmm. um, in the sense that in a way chess uh, invented computers, right? Chess was there before computers. Chess was one of the inspirations, right? People, you know, like like Babbage looking at chess and thinking, huh, I wonder, that's kind of like a little bit like a machine, right? It's yeah, like- it's a system with defined system, rules. Exactly. You yeah. have these symbolic things that are mm-hmm. being manipulated mm-hmm. according to rules. And then there's like inputs and outputs. And it's like, um, th- that was already there in a way in, in games. So I think- um, this border between video games and other kinds of games, I yeah. think is, we, we overemphasize it because yeah. it's a bit, I think it's parochial. I think in, in the, you know, we see computer games and, and these other games as being so distinct and separate. Right. But I actually think that there's a lot that they have in common. And what about computer games and sports? Because I, I mean, yeah. the rise of esports has been phenomenal to watch. Yeah. Um, but I also wonder, you know, like you see people, uh, all these CTE studies with in the NFL around concussions. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if in our lifetime, you know, Dota will be bigger than the NFL by a multiple. Uh, I would probably take the under on that. Okay. Uh, even though as much as I love esports, <laughs> um, I'm also like... Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I like everybody. I, I predict what's going to happen by looking at what's currently happening yeah, and, yeah. and extending it into the future. And and so, um, League of Legends is huge, uh, but it's already showing signs of like, yeah, that's it's Peak. not going to grow indefinitely. Yeah, it's kind of like leveling off and okay. Um, and you could you could make the case that League of Legends is bigger than hockey, right? Mm-hmm. More people watch the the League of Legends World Championship than than watch the Stanley Cup. But esports, but I don't think aggregate. it's going to be bigger than yeah. football. But yeah, something else could come along, or like another like right. another esport, or or esports overall. Like maybe you could make an argument that overall esports is already yep you could as big as as NFL. But um, but I I. Do you think that um, we are going to see other um, kinds of of games, uh, other kinds of games, be, be, you know, in esports? Yeah, like it's not. I don't think we're looking at like like whatever you know, League of Legends and Counter Strike and Hearthstone and Overwatch, maybe StarCraft. I don't know. Yeah. Like I don't think those. I don't think we're going to be stuck with those for the next twenty or thirty years. Uh, but it's not clear what the next ones are going to be. I right. think it's a really interesting question. Drone racing? I don't know. It would be interesting if it was some hybrid of physical and digital. I would like to imagine that that's <laughs> where it's going, right? Like, to me, there'd be something really cool about... You ever watch fencing in the Olympics? Absolutely They're all not. wired up. <laughs> really? And, yeah, they're they're super wired up and they fence on these platforms. That's cool. That light up when you, when you get a hit. It's like they're already there's a kind of cyborg yeah. element of of some of so it's a physical and it's beautiful to watch physically, but there's already this like weird electronic element of it. I don't know. I can imagine a thing like that that's designed to draw from the tradition of of physical athletics and yep. incorporate the the complexity that you can get from software. 
um, to create some kind of hybrid thing. I think that would be amazing. Um, I can't point to a well. There was the that, example of uh, it, but the void thing, the like laser tag with the backpacks, mixed reality. Oh, how'd, how'd that do? I mean, they've opened up a bunch of them. Oh, oh, is it like a? Is it like a? I think they were the ones that did the Star Wars thing in okay. Times Square okay. or something. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so it's like a headset, so maybe backpack combo. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Let's get a film crew down there and see if we can. Uh, yeah. Make a. <laughs> well, <laughs> esports. I, yeah, I do. I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it, I mean, it makes sense, you know, like things like CrossFit have just happened in the past 15 years. Yeah. Like why wouldn't another yeah. sport come in? Yeah. That's like completely integrated. And I you see people trying to invent, I think it's hard to invent a sport. I see my, my theory about this yeah. is that you really can't invent a sport. You can invent games and sometimes games can evolve into sports. Okay. Um, but I, it's very hard, I think, to invent a sport. Like, because I think what a sport is, is when a game acquires a scale where there's a big dedicated community and there's organized play yeah. and there's some kind of like attempt to create a global system of rules and regulations and tracking and there's a fan base and then there are people who are doing it for a living it's like now you know you've got a sport yeah you know um that's what makes chess feel like a sport more than a game, even if a game might have, like, I, I might invent a game that has more physical stuff in it than chess. Yeah. And that's one of the things that makes something feel like a sport is that right. it's physical. But the main thing that makes it feel like a sport is all this other, this institutional stuff, of right? Course. So, and I, and you can't invent that, right? That has to accumulate. That has to somehow be the world's response to this game that you've invented. Well, in many ways, it's probably riding the wave of a macro trend, right? Like the iPhone couldn't have been made in 1930. Yeah. Like those sensors had to exist. All yeah. these things had to have to exist. And then you have to kind of invent it at the time, but yeah. also be on the wave at the right time. Yeah. It's one of those things. It's, it's, it's about being in conversation with the world, right? It's yeah. like you're making something and there's something you like. And then at a certain point, the world blinks and takes notice and the yeah. next thing you know you're rolling in money <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like every story yeah uh, do you think pokemon go was like a, a freak event or do you think there there's an ar future uh of games? i think pokemon go um was the result of uh a lot of internal r&d yeah. by google which people didn't see because it was ingress this game that not a lot of people were playing a game that probably would not have was probably not making enough money to be a going concern on its own but was kept alive by by google as as a kind of proof of concept and a way to like understand location and how it might uh, fit into these larger kinds of game mm -hmm. patterns. And so they they really had an opportunity to kind of explore that and work out a lot of the the design issues and build um, a real deep understanding and knowledge. And then you combine that with the world's most popular IP, <laughs> Pokemon, right? And and you got a hit. Like, yeah. like that, it was certainly no guarantee. There's no guarantees in this world. It's easy to imagine a world in which that was a flop. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't. It was a big success. Mm -hmm. So it's not that those things were were either on their own necessary or sufficient. But I think those two things, I think, really helped um, make Pokemon Go what it was. Um, and I think that it's not exactly a fluke. I think that... Um, it's certainly a proof of concept mm -hmm. that a game like that can work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see a ton of other people. I don't. I, that doesn't you know strike me as yet being a space where there's a lot of interesting work happening or a lot of successful yeah. games coming in the wake of Pokemon Go. So, um, and um, I think AR like VR is a thing that sounds great, and a lot of people are very excited about it. And I'm, yeah, I'm interested in things that, um, that actually are great, even though they yeah. don't necessarily sound great. Yeah. Like, like I'm looking for that next, um, 
you know, Hunger Games that that, that like the where it, yeah, where we look over yeah. and it's like, wait a minute, every fourteen year old on the planet is doing this thing and no one's heard of it. Um, versus a thing that everybody's talking about and there are lots of conferences on, but no one's doing yeah. it. So right now, I think there's like, but that's my personal take. I mean, I think that there's, um, yeah, I think. There's a lot of opportunity there, and I expect to be surprised. Well, there's so, so many cool knows? ideas that are thrown around, you know, like the Netflix for games type stuff, mm-hmm. uh, episodic content, episodic yep. games, like binge games. Um, certainly sounds good. But, yeah, you look around, you're like, mm, yeah, that's, mm, maybe. Yeah, okay. It's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's very hard to predict things in general it's particularly hard to predict entertainment yeah because part of the job of art and entertainment is to be unpredictable right part of the job like the the netflix the 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 dilemma that netflix has in their recommendation algorithm right um which is, I don't know, called the Napoleon Dynamite problem or something. I remember reading about this. Yeah, oh, I don't know. They have this problem where it's like, for a while, they, you know, they were like, yeah, it's really hard to like write a recommendation algorithm. There's like certain movies where everything gets n- knotted up and like every, you know, they sort of like it, you, you kind of like lose the ability, the predictive power. Um, uh, and so they, yeah, they define this as the Napoleon Dynamite problem. Um, and, and in a way, like, that's what, Art and entertainment are trying to do. Yeah. They're, it's fashion. It's 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 surfing this wave of interest and attention, and it's staying one step ahead of our ability to predict mm-hmm. what like what the couple is good like where the movie's gonna where the plot's gonna go. Yeah, like as soon as you can predict where the plot's what's gonna happen that you know that that they're gonna break up or they're gonna get back together. It's like then the movie doesn't work. The movie works yeah. because we have these established patterns of how movies work. And then the movies are surprising us yeah. by doing it slightly differently. Yeah. By constantly figuring out some new twist or some new flavor or all of a sudden it's, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that's how you get these, these waves of, of, of things that come and go of cowboy movies and pirate movies and monster movies and superhero movies and you're like well i guess that's it i guess from now on it's going to be superhero movies but no and it's not happens, but yeah. good luck predicting what the next one is going to be yeah because that's david lynch's job right that's or, you know that's jj abrams job like that is art right that is design that is that is entertainment yeah. and uh, and it's like an arms race between the human brain and itself Right to mm-hmm. be interesting and surprising, <laughs> but it's, it, yeah, and not only that, well, it's, yeah. it's the artist versus the collective of yeah. humanity, and which is why yes. I was never really a Banksy fan. But man, the painting shredding is like, oh, <laughs> he, he got me. He got you. Yeah, he got me on that he one. Got you. Get on him. Um, so yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so the last the last question I'm curious about is okay. um, if you could recommend a handful of games for people to play to like cut their teeth oh. and and kind of like maybe dive deep into something that they might not have heard before. Um well, you should definitely play Universal Paperclips. That <laughs> goes without saying. Yeah. Um there I don't know. I love the games of uh of, of a designer named Michael Bro. Okay. He's my favorite uh, game designer. And um so he has a new game out called Cinco Pouse which I play every day and I love and I think is beautiful. Um, definitely recommend that. Um, there's a game coming out soon uh, by a friend of mine uh, named uh, Gabe Cazillo called Ape Out, which uh, I think you want to definitely um, uh, keep on your radar. It's, uh, I think, coming out in February. It's going to be a masterpiece. Um, uh there, I don't know if like if you're interested in stories and and games, there have been a lot of really interesting experiments uh, with with storytelling. Um, uh, there's there's a game called Her Story, okay. um, which uh, came out last year or maybe a year and a half ago. Um, it's really weird and interesting and fascinating. Um, there is uh, What Remains of Edith Finch, I think, is a great example 
of this genre that some people call the walking simulator, where hmm. it's not a game about puzzles and challenges. It's just using 3D environments and spaces to tell stories and create experiences. I think it's a really beautiful example of that. Um, I would, uh, uh, yeah, those are I, I've done, uh, a, a game called Everything uh, by David O'Reilly, <laughs> okay. which was probably my favorite game from from last year. Just a weird, interesting, like uh, transcendent game about uh, about meditation and and um, and consciousness <laughs> on, that you can play on your PlayStation. Um, so I don't, those are some of the ones that just that's a good pop list pop into mind. Um, I also want to mention there was a question that someone asked about yeah. uh, on Twitter that there was the question was why Tonto? Yes. So, um, and I think what that person was referring to was Tonto's expanding headband, which is the name of the musical group that did the song that I used in Universal Paper Clips. <laughs> and so um, the story behind that song was, um, yeah, so there, Tonto's expanding headband is a like a very early experimental electronic group uh, from from the 60s. Okay. Um, experimenting with, yeah, with synthesizers like way before anyone else and trying to figure out how to compose music like that. Um, I had an album of theirs lying around. I had a, a USB turntable that I was using to like digitize stuff. And so I had digitized uh, a bunch of the tracks off that album. They happened to be sitting on my computer and I was working on the game and in this, in Universal Paperclips is silent. You play this game for like six <laughs> hours. There's no sound at yeah, all. It's yeah. just you clicking. And then at a certain point, you, um, at a certain point, you as the AI have to kind of reinvent music because you're in charge of this giant drone swarm that's at war <laughs> with the drifters mm -hmm. and you need to somehow rally the troops. And so you compose this piece of music uh, which is a threnody, right? It's an it's an elegy. It's like this mournful uh, song about the the brave uh, drones that have given their life in this battle against the drifters. And so, um, when you compose it, all of a sudden it starts playing. So I needed a piece of music, mm -hmm. and I just grabbed one of the tracks off this album and and I stuck it in as a placeholder. It was just called Test MP3. <laughs> and as soon as I heard it, I knew this was it could never not be this piece of music. It was the most perfect thing. It was like, it was just this accident, but it was without a doubt, like exactly the piece of music that that this AI who's in the process of destroying the universe <laughs> would write. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was just so good that I knew it. I just had to have this in the game. And so I liked, I looked up the, this, I said, is this, are this, is this band still around? Um, and uh, and sure enough, like one of the the uh, one of the members of this group is still alive. Um, and so I just wrote him an email. I said, oh, I'm making this free web game and uh, I want to use your music. Is that OK? And I didn't hear back from him. And I thought, well, whatever, I guess it doesn't really matter because no one's ever going to play this game. Right, yeah. <laughs> so then, I, then I launched the game and, you know, in a couple of days, like my server had melted and you know it was like and, it, and eventually you know it had been played like by a, a million or more people and so um after a couple months uh i got an email back from from this guy and he was like uh yeah sure go ahead <laughs> so i was like okay Whew. um and i was very happy and i think a lot of people um a lot of people loved this song and like, who is it who is it and yeah. so i i i i linked to 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 him in the, in the credits and so I hopefully have driven some some traffic and mm -hmm. and uh, some some interest uh, to 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 his work and uh, um, but that's the story of cool of uh, the, the song and their Spotify resurgence yes yeah. hopefully <laughs> all right man thanks so much all right well thanks it was a real pleasure cool thank you.